Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Dave Gilchrist. I work at Bookmarks Bookshop. I'm here tonight to introduce tonight's Bookmark event. Uh, we're very proud and privileged to have tonight two legendary socialists, Roger Huddle uh, and John Newsinger, introducing our discussion on George Orwell. Um, Roger, of course, is one of the founders, along with Red Sanders, of Rock Against Racism. They are the people that wrote the letter to the NME. They started a whole a new youth movement against uh, racism and uh, was very important in the fight uh, against racism. John Newsinger is an author who has written very many books, several on Orwell, uh, and also a, blood a, a book called The Blood Never Dried about the British Empire, which in fact is Bookmark's top seller of all time continues to sell in large numbers today, which is both great, but a shame for John, because if he'd done it for a commercial publisher, he'd probably made money out of it. <laughs> um, but it, all he gets is kudos from us. Um, but that book continues to sell in, in large numbers. Um, Roger is going to talk uh, about a, a meeting or a talk that another legendary socialist, uh, Paul Foote, uh, did uh, on the subject of George, George Orwell's book, 1984, that uh, Foote did in 84. Uh, Foote, for those that don't know, was a, a campaigning journalist. He used to have a page in the Daily Mirror where he uh, would highlight uh, workers that were in struggle, strikes, uh, people that uh, were being oppressed in some way or done down, and generally, you know, uh, bigged up the labour movement in, in that um mass circulation a newspaper. He was also a legendary speaker, um, a man that could make you laugh, make you cry uh, virtually uh, simultaneously. It was very entertaining, very enlightening, uh, and very knowledgeable on a whole range of subjects, uh, in, including uh, George Orwell. Um, so let's bring into our picture our other um, our two guests, that's uh, John on the left and Roger in the centre there. Uh, we'll um, have about um, half an hour, 40 minutes of, of them, the two of them talking, and then we'll have time uh, for discussion afterwards, uh, just as we would if we were in the bookshop. Of course, uh, in this situation, uh, what you have to do is put your comments and your questions in, in the live chat um, and we'll tick them up. And I was just saying before we began that of course everybody waits for the last five minutes and puts them in so don't do that folks. Get your questions in as quick as as, as you can. So uh, you've usually I'm in the background pressing the buttons and don't have to do all this talking uh, so that's enough from me. I'm going to hand you over to Roger now who's going to talk uh, about foot and, and about a little bit about that meeting uh, on 1984 and some other meetings that Paul Foote did. So that's over to you, Roger. Okay, thanks. Hello, everyone. Um, it's very difficult to know where to start with someone like Paul, but I suppose I'd better start with our little pamphlet that we, uh, that Red Words put out. Um, and John Rudge uh, wonderfully uh, copied uh, the speech that Paul made in 1984, about 1984, but also about uh, George Orwell. Now, he made it, 1984 is interesting, because 1984, was in, the speech was made at Skegness. Now, for a lot of older comrades, they remember uh, Skegness either with the horror or with great um, fondness. We, uh, we, the whole of the SWP used to meet at Skegness at the Derbyshire Hol uh, Miners Holiday Camp um, every Easter. And uh, we, there, there was talks would take place, drinking would take place, much socialising, much moaning about the food, etc. And in, Ske in Skegness in 1984, uh, Paul uh, made the talk, that made, did his talk there, because that was the year the book title, but also gave him a chance to talk about George Orwell and George Orwell's um, uh, tradition and his legacy with inside the revolutionary movement in Britain. 
Um, but also what was interesting, it was 1984, uh, Thatcher came uh, for a second term in 1983 um, after Kinnock and the Labour right had smashed the left and, and Tony Benn, um, absolutely certain that they would then be able to walk into number 10, and of course they didn't, and Thatcher came in. And it is even just another year, uh, 83, 82 was the uh, Falklands War, uh, where uh, Paul Foote's uncle, Michael Foote, uh, basically gave the land, they gave the uh, war or gave the uh, the, the go ahead uh, for the task force to sail to the South Atlantic. So that was the kind of mood that was there. The uh, the Labour, we were trying desperately to hold on to an organisation of revolutionaries uh, on the belief that socialism from below is the key way forward. So this was the the way that uh, Paul gave the meeting about uh, about George Orwell and the book 1984. There's more to it than that. You should buy the pamphlet, of course. But the uh, what he says as well is that George Orwell, like Paul himself, and with another great revolutionary, William Morris, all came from the upper classes, all came from public school, from university, and what William Morris called, they crossed the river of fire. They left their class and joined our class. And Paul did that in 1962, joining the, uh, the International Socialists. Um, and he remained a fighting revolutionary socialist writer, uh, talker from that to his death, uh, which was tragic in, in uh, 2002, 24. Um, so uh, that was Paul Foot. I mean, I joined the IS four years later in 1966. And the first meeting I went to as a member of the International Socialist was Paul Foot um, on uh, immigration and race in British politics. He wrote books. He wrote three books on against race. He wrote a wonderful book on Enoch Powell, uh, which it completely exposed him. And of course, from the class that he was, his background, he had incredible knowledge and hatred uh, for the people in his class that he saw as uh, as corrupt, as rotten, as uh, without ethics or without morale. And that, and he saw capitalism in all its rottenness, um, much the same way as William Morris did, in fact. Um, he uh, he was absolutely appalled uh, by the people from his own class, and Paul was the same. Paul Foot was the same. Um, then the year after 1984, in 1985, of course, it was the uh, it was the end of the miners' strike, and Paul Foot came to Skegness that year, armed with a different talk, with a different uh, a, a different need for for us as, as socialists and for revolutionaries facing that dreadful defeat of the miners and then all what was gone on since. So Paul Foot came to Skegness and everybody there uh, went into one huge hall and Paul did a vividing one hour talk on Percy Bly Shelley's uh, The Ode to the West Wind. And he held us all spellbind because The Ode to the West Wind was written when Shelley was in Italy, and it was written um, uh, when he saw the the tyranny of the British government, the, the, the tyranny that the Tories in Britain were holding the British people to, uh, the slaughter at uh, 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 Peter Fields, uh, the uh, banning of all books, the uh, fantastic oppression of all working class uh, societies and all attempts to organisation. And, and, and the, uh, the poem, uh, Ode to the West Wind, ends famously when the, he says that the West, when, if the West, when you hear the West Wind uh, blows, then the, uh, then the sun, the spring is not far behind. And the whole poem was about, don't despair, we can fight on, the, the struggle will continue. And that was Paul Foote's uh, legacy, if you like. Paul Foote, um, was part of our tradition that goes back to the levellers of the British uh, of the English Civil War, goes back to uh, John Milton, the, the poet, goes back to Bunyan, goes back to Jonathan Swift, and goes back to the corresponding society, and it goes back to that uh, that whole that tradition 
uh, of uh, Cobbett and the uh, the great fighters of the of the Chartists and the great struggles for the reform movement in the late nineteenth century. So, foot I, uh, for me, foot represented the, that side of the tradition with inside the revolutionary socialist left of the international socialists and the SWP, and it was uh, that was incredible. Um, he came. Uh, after that, we uh, I worked with Paul during the whole of the 70s on Socialist Worker. He was writing for the paper. I was uh, pasting it up as a, as a, as a layout artist. And uh, working with him, and we got to talking about the New Left Book Club and the need for uh, socialist publications. Uh, Paul was an incredible, incredible uh, lover of books. And uh, he, he taught everybody, or ga always gave a book off his shelf if he needed, if he you needed to read something. He did it uh, uh, without a problem. In 1991, um, we decided, along with a man called Peter Marsden, who was working at Bookmarks, uh, we decided to form Red Words. Um, and the very, very first book that we did uh, was Shelley's po Peterloo uh, poems. The it was called the Percy Blythe Shelley's Revolutionary Year, and within inside that little book we had the poems, including "No to the West Wind," "Mask of Anarchy," and all the other poems that uh, that uh, uh, wrote uh, that Shelley wrote during uh, during that year of oppression of nineteen of, of eighteen nineteen. So that was the first book we did in, in 1991, and uh, we just republished that book last year. Um, I'm very, very happy that we've finally started doing little uh, pamphlets, and I'm hoping that the Paul's uh, speech on George Orwell will be the first of lots of pamphlets that we can bring out um, in, in the foreseeable future as we get back to some kind of agitational life. And that's the last thing I want to say really about Paul. Um, he, he adds favourite words, but I, it echoes in my mind continuously, and I'm sure that other people who experienced his talking um, remembers. He used to put his fist out like this, and he used to go, we must agitate, agitation, agitate, agitate, agitate. And that was the word that he loved more than anything, is that the Chartists would get amongst it, and we would agitate. And the Socialists would agitate, and the Revolution would agitate. And he always, always emphasize the, the action that came from an idea, the ideas turn into action, and that action being an agitation, a way to shake up the world. And that was, that was his, I think, his favorite word. And I'll end with what Dave said at the beginning about the humor. Um, when Paul Foote and Tony Cliff were on the same platform, I can assure you that the, the humor became the weapon against the ruling class. The humour became the way in which we bonded together in our laughter at the absurdity of capitalism, at the anarchy of capitalism, at the absolute uh, dreadful misery that capitalism brings to the world. And in that way of using humour, of using, uh, you know, a weapon, as a weapon, as a sword of, of, of a struggle, a sword of fighting, the language of Paul Foote would uh, would shine bright, and that was what he, that was his legacy was the the means with which he held agitation, propaganda, and socialism coming from below as the as the absolute key words. Um, he never ever forgot that the emancipation of the working class is the act of the working class themselves, and he always always looked to to the bottom to see the struggle, and that's all I really want to say. I think if uh, we go over now to, to John to talk about the wonderful, uh, wonderful uh, George Orwell. I couldn't hear a word of that. 
Can people hear me? I'm trusting people can hear me. Anyway, um, with, 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 when um, Trump become president is one of his people, Kellyanne Conway, very famously remarked uh, about the size of the um, number of people it is, you know, the size of the crowd it is ignore inauguration. That, um, you know, his figure was much higher than anyone else's. His figure was much higher than the number of people who were there. Uh, and this was an alternative fact, which I'm sure people can remember. Uh, and in the weeks following her remark, um, 1984 um, rose to be the number one book on the New York Times bestsellers list and for a while was the number one book on uh, the American Amazon bestsellers list. In fact, the sales of the book went up, I've got it written down here, the sales of the uh, of 1984 rose um, by something like 9,000%, um, right through the roof. Uh, and I, I think this is quite important because what it shows uh, is that even, you know, so many years after his death, 70 odd years after his death, what Orwell wrote still resonates with people. Um, people can still turn to Orwell's writings um, in order uh, to get uh, an understanding of what's happening now. And, and I would say you can see this in terms of um, the road to Wigan Pier, in terms of, you know, the unemployment, the, um, the, the uh, coming in of um, underemployment, the, the zero hours contracts, all, all this stuff, you can get uh, an understanding of this today from what Orwell wrote back then. As far as revolution is concerned, you, you've got homage to Catalonia. Um, and what you've got with uh, 1984, of course, is uh, I would argue today that the recognition of powerlessness um, and that they can bend the truth um, in any way they want and that, you know, two plus Two can equal five. Um, this this is this is the way uh, in which the system can be rigged. Um, what's interesting, though, is, is that you know while you had uh, a lot of people who were either already on the left or were being radicalised, look to Orwell. We have to recognise um, that there are um, people right across the political spectrum that lay claim uh, to the man. Um, only recently, Donald Trump Jr was saying that uh, um, the uh, Americans, and you know, particularly the Trump supporters, uh, were actually um, living through George Orwell's 1984. Those were his exact words. Um, he's got this inspiration from a bloke called Mark Dice, um, who, who's actually written a huge number of books on the Illuminati uh, and has written a book on Orwell claiming that Trump supporters are the new trolls, to be believed. Um, and this is an important point because there has been a battle over Orwell, um, you know, even before he died. You had people in the United States in particular laying claim to him as an anti-socialist. And he actually wrote protesting about this, um, you know, this hijacking of his work. But of course, he died before he could do anything about it. Um, I would argue that, um, you know, Orwell is one of us. Um, Orwell. If the barricade went up, Orwell would be on our side of the barricade without any doubt, or you know, he would have been back then. We don't know how he would have developed if he'd have lived. He was only 46 when he died. But for his adult life, Orwell would have been on our side of the barricades, even though we would have had many differences with him and he would have had many differences with us. We'd have been on the same side. So I think it's quite important, um, especially the number of people who are now interested in Orwell, that we reclaim him, if you like, um, or lay claim to him for our tradition, our heritage. Now, like Roger said, the, the um, Paul Foot speech and pamphlet, I, I think, is very, very important um, a, a, as one of the early um, attempts to place um, Orwell in our tradition. If you want to find an even earlier one, there's Paul, P, um, Peter Sedgwick's article uh, in, in an old um, international socialism going back donkey's years to the 60s. Um, it, unfortunately, it was only ever um, George Orwell, International Socialist Part One. Uh, he never actually wrote Part Two, which is an enormous shame. But uh, to me, this was the first time that I thought, blimey, um, Orwell is one of us. All the stuff I was told at school is a load of rubbish. Orwell was a socialist. Um, he was a socialist from the 1930s onwards. He was a socialist uh, when he died. Th th this, to me, became um, the sort of touchstone of understanding his politics. Now, as people know, um, Orwell, you know, went to public school, 
Uh, when he left Eton, uh, he went out to be a policeman in Burma, which is hardly a sign of radicalism. Uh, but there's no doubt that what he saw in Burma uh, had a Im tremendous impact on him, turned him against the British Empire, and also um, left him with feelings of guilt and a determination to identify with the downtrodden and oppressed. And when he came back to Britain, um, and you know, first of all, um, in, in terms of down and out in Paris and London, uh, he looks at um, the casual workers, the unemployed, uh, the homeless. He goes on the tramp. Um, but what you get in, in, in when he comes to write the road to Wigan Pier, of course, is uh, he turns his attention uh, to, to, to the uh, industrial working class, if you like, um, and, and um, is looking to these people. Um, in a context of defeat, I think it's important to recognise. When he wrote The Road to Wigan Pier, uh, he's writing it in the aftermath of the general strike. Um, he's writing it in the aftermath of the 1929-31 Labour government, which had both been massive defeats uh, for the working class. It's worth remembering that um, when, when uh, uh, in 1931, when Ramsay MacDonald uh, put himself at the head of a coalition government, uh, in the general election that followed, Labour were reduced to 46 seats in Parliament. This was a massive defeat. So the working class was reeling from these defeats. Uh, and when Orwell went uh, up north uh, to look at how working class people were living, he was going up to a, 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 a situation where the working class was on the defensive. There was a fight back beginning, but they were on the defensive. Um, uh, and this, this was the working class that he portrayed. The working class, I would argue, um, really is victim uh, in many respects. You know, the, the, the fight that was beginning, the miners um, were starting to uh, organise themselves again. Um, but nevertheless, you know, this was still, uh, uh, there was still a long way to go. Um, and all well identified, I would argue, absolutely. I mean, when he goes round, uh, it would much to his surprise, only once was he told to bugger off. Um, and he thought that the, the woman who refused to talk to him when he was trying to ask about, you know, the condition she was living in, um, he, he thought that uh, she assumed that he'd come to set the rates uh, uh, and told him to bugger off. But by and large, uh, people were extremely helpful. And if you read The Road to Wigan Pier, I would argue you have to read it in conjunction with the diary he kept. Um, the two things go together. You can't understand the one without having read the uh, other one as well. So from that point of view, he identifies absolutely with the working class, uh, but it's the working class as victim. Um, he's moving to the left. He, he, he flirts with the Communist Party, but he falls out with the Communist Party. The party that really interests him um, is the Independent Labour Party, uh, which had broken uh, from the Labour Party after 31, uh, had moved dramatically to the left, had quite a few revolutionary socialists in its ranks uh, at this time, and even people who weren't revolutionary socialists were becoming very, very radical. People like Fenner Brockway were becoming very radical at this time. Uh, and what cements his politics, I would argue, um, is, is when he goes to Spain. Originally, he, he wanted to go as part of the International Brigade, but the CP wouldn't let him. Apparently, Harry Pollitt personally vetoed him. Um, I would argue this probably saved his life because they'd have probably bumped him off uh, if he had gone as part of the International Brigade because he wouldn't be able to keep his mouth shut. But, um, you know, instead he goes and joins up with the Poon. Um, and uh, fights on, on, on the uh, Catalan front uh, and becomes involved in the May events um, in, in uh, Barcelona. And what Orwell talked from this, I would argue, is two very important things. No, let me put another three very important things. First of all, what he argues um, is that, you know, he's seen the working class take power. He's seen the working class as victim back in Britain. In Barcelona, he saw the working class in the saddle as he put it himself, the working class in power, um, and it was something that he thought was good. You know, this was good. The working class had taken power. He had seen revolution. He knew the working class would take power. And I would say this idea remained with him for the rest of his life. What he also saw um, was that the Communist Party in Spain, uh, the Comintern in Spain, pay, played a counter-revolutionary role. Um, and this was very important for his political development because from then on, he saw uh, Stalinism as an enemy of working class power. Um, you know, although the communists got a lot of credit for the International Brigade and many of the International Brigaders themselves were very brave, self-sacrificing people. 
Um, nevertheless, you know, Stalin was absolutely cynical. It was all about great power politics. He only had two motives in Spain. Uh, one was to roll back the revolution so that he could um, go about creating an alliance with Britain and France. Any revolution would be embarrassing from that point of view. Uh, and I would argue he also was worried that a successful workers' revolution uh, would inevitably expose um, the full horror uh, of the regime that he was running uh, in, in Russia. He couldn't allow a genuine workers' revolution to be successful because what he was running had nothing to do uh, with, with uh, working class power whatsoever. The third thing I would argue that Orwell comes back with as an understanding is that the ruling class will never surrender their wealth and power without a fight. The degree of violence might vary from country to country according to um, all sorts of cultural and political factors, but you could be pretty, not pretty certain, you could be certain that the ruling class uh, would never hand over their wealth, would never hand over their power without making a fight of it. And this had been shown by the rise of fascism, and this was absolutely concretely shown as far as he was concerned, uh, and as far as a lot of other people um, in the uh, ILP at this time, um, you know, that, 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 that they would um, use force to try and bring down uh, even an elected government that tried to carry through radical social reform, that tried to uh, introduce socialism. Uh, and this, I would argue, is something that Orwell had in his mind once again, right up until his death, that any attempt to introduce radical change and the ruling class would respond to it um, by uh, bringing down the government by whatever means were necessary. Uh, and Orwell was absolutely prepared, as he made clear on a number of occasions, both through the war um, and after the war, that if it came to it, the attempt by the ruling class to get in the way of a socialist transformation, it would have to be put down by force. Um, and as he put it on one occasion, if the gutters have to run with blood, so be it. Um, this, 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 this was something that, as far as he was concerned, had been demonstrated absolutely clearly um, by what had gone on in Europe uh, in the 1930s. You know, that the ruling class would use whatever force was necessary in order to try and hold on to power. Um, th 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 these three principles, I think, remain with him. What you do get, though, is, is um, Orwell has the idea, um, and this, I think, comes from this puts him in danger, if you like, uh, because he's not in a revolutionary organization. He's always discussing with people. He's always reading up on things. He was a voracious reader of pamphlets. Um, he devoured books. He was continually discussing and arguing with people um, from you know, anarchists, Trotskyists, um, you know, people on the left generally, just about anyone except Stalinists. Um, Orwell was engaged in discussions with these people. Um, but what you get, I think, is um, he falls prey on a number of occasions to what I would call lesser evilism. If you're not going to get a socialist revolution, then you have to grab hold of something else. And I think on a number of occasions, as we see, as we see this leads him astray. Um, in the war, uh, Orwell decides to support the war. Initially, in the run-up to the war, Orwell is opposed to it. Um, he, he sees it as an imperialist war that's coming. But when the war breaks out, he actually adopts a position of um, in, what, what in the line and the unicorn is revolutionary patriotism. Um, but in other writings that uh, he produced at the time, he makes quite clear that while um, he was prepared to try and win over a middle class audience with uh, a, a sort of left wing patriotism, as far as he was concerned, and he actually used this um, phrase um, in, in a, a left book club publication during the war, that, you know, the Trotsky slogan um, it w was the right one, that, um, you know, you, you couldn't um, bring the war to an end without a revolution. Uh, and I would argue for this and thought it was coming. Orwell thought that a revolution was going to come in Britain. Um, and, and, you know, he did his best to help it along uh, with, with, with his publications. Uh, and he began writing for a Trotskyist journal in the United States, Partisan Review, something that is often forgot, often written out. It's it, it, played down, and yet his major writings, um, his major political writings in the war were written for an American Trotskyist publication, and it's from that organization that he got the idea um, that informs 
1984 of oligarchical collectivism. They called it bureaucratic collectivism. They were um, a, a sort of heretics as far as Trotsky was concerned. They didn't accept the idea of a deformed worker state. They argued that you had a new kind of class society with a bureaucratic ruling class. Didn't have a state capitalist analysis, um, but nevertheless, you know, that they saw a new class as having emerged. And Orwell is very influenced by this, as we can see. He's also very influenced by Trotsky's writings on, you know, how the Russian Revolution went wrong. Although when it came down to it, he agreed more with the anarchists uh, that the revolution had gone wrong as early as Kronstadt rather than the Trotskyist analysis. So he's looking around, he's arguing, um, he, he, he's um, coming up with, you know, visiting all sorts of ideas uh, and working his own way forward. Um, what you get, though, is by the time you get to 42, uh, he recognises there isn't going to be a revolution. The British have been saved by the Russians and the Americans coming into the war. Uh, and as far as he's concerned, um, the, the reactionaries have triumphed with the suppression of the Quit India movement. Um, you know, which was put down with a great deal of force and violence, um, you know, with, with Labour absolutely going along with the repression. Uh, this was this was the end, as far as he is concerned, of any real prospect of revolution, of reaction, of triumph. And what you get is Orwell goes to it work. He's been working for the BBC as a propagandist. Um, in the, and it's interesting, let me just say this, that, you know, the BBC have, of course, tried to hijack Orwell and have put a statue to him. Um, outside uh, the BBC, uh, and Orwell himself said that um, working for the BBC was like being an orange being squashed by a very muddy boot. Um, and I think this is, would have been a much better statue uh, than the one they've actually put up, would have been much truer to what Orwell uh, felt about the uh, the BBC. He goes to work for Tribune, um, the Labour Party newspaper, but it's worth being clear that at this time it was so um, out of step with mainstream labor which was wholeheartedly behind the coalition and in his role as literary editor Orwell welcomed into the paper um, people right across the political spectrum anarchists trotskyists all sorts of independent leftists once again anyone just about except the stalinists they were welcome uh, into Orwell's section of the newspaper uh, and he thought at that time that um, Bevan um, was you know a, a, a key figure who would play a vital part in, in furthering the socialist cause. Um, but once again, he still argued very strongly that the ruling class would take um, active measures to bring a government down, including the use of force, uh, and this would have to be dealt with. You know, the working class would have to rise up um, in order to defend uh, meaningful change, and this would uh, involve completely dispossessing um, the, 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 the rich, they would lose everything, they would be stripped of everything, there'd be no compensation, the working class would take over. This was all world vision. Uh, when it came to Labour getting elected in 1945, um, Orwell was very disappointed. Um, he, he assumed that, that they would be much more radical, partly I think because Bevan had actually joined the government. Um, he assumed they were much more radical, he was very disappointed. Uh, and writing in an American journal once again, uh, he said that the clue that they weren't radical was that the ruling class weren't trying to overthrow them. Simple as that. The ruling class weren't trying to overthrow them. This showed that they weren't that radical. Um, he, one of the things he you know, couldn't understand, for example, is why didn't they close down the secret state? Um, Orwell, you know, uh, uh, had uh, been investigating himself, a special branch man when he was, when he was uh, in Wigan, had you know, been sent to investigate him. And very cunningly, it worked out that I think he's an author because he spends a lot of time writing. Um, you know, this, this is the, the sharpness of these people sometimes takes you by surprise. We must underestimate them. Um, he couldn't understand why a Labour government hadn't cleared out all the top generals, hadn't got rid of the secret state. Um, this shows a degree of um, illusion in Labour. And I think. Um, a criticism we can make of him is that he really uh, never got his head round um, the, the uh, nature of Labourism uh, and its political limitations and weaknesses. Um, he never thought they were going to introduce socialism after these early days. And when he comes to write what is his last political statement in many respects, um, an article um, 
towards European unity that once again appeared in the American Trotskyist magazine, Partisan Review. It was part of a series on the future of socialism. Victor Surd wrote another contribution. Um, he argues, he, he doesn't say the way forward is to elect a Labour government and do what the British Labour government are doing. Doesn't say that at all. Doesn't even mention what Labour are doing. What he says is the situation is pretty hopeless at the minute if you're a socialist. Now, this does rather suggest that he didn't think Labour were actually in the business of introducing socialism. The welfare state is all well and good, but as he pointed it out, it wasn't socialism. In fact, Beveridge, the man whose ideas they pinched, was a bloody liberal. Um, this, 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 this was not socialism as far as he was concerned. It was ameliorating the situation of the working class, but it wasn't getting rid of the ruling class and putting the working class in power. Um, in, in, in the little pamphlet, I point out that the Duke of Westminster um, was a, a multi-millionaire. He supported the Nazis in the war but because he was a, 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 a duke. They, they successfully kept him out of prison. Um, four Labour governments later, his son is still there, a multi-billionaire. I think he's, he's still below the age of 30. So four Labour governments and the Duke of Westminster's wealth has gone from being a multi-millionaire to a multi-billionaire. That shows how successful Labour reformism has been in terms of curbing the power uh, of the ruling class. Um, what you get, though, is Orwell, um, I would argue, comes up with the, uh, confronts the lesser evilism. He's very worried about Stalinism. He's written Animal Farm about the revolution betrayed. Um, he's absolutely clear that he's not rejecting revolution. What he's against is the betrayal of that revolution. The book, um, I would argue, is a revolutionary book uh, and in conversation with American Trotskyist Dwight MacDonald, he absolutely makes it clear he's not rejecting revolution. Um, it's about the betrayal of revolution. And in 1984, of course, what you get is a portrayal of Stalinist society from the point of view of the bureaucratic collectivist analysis. Uh, and I think that the belief that uh, Britain uh, was going to go into some sort of war situation with the Soviet Union, that this was very much on the agenda. This leads him into um, seeing labor, even with its limitations, as a lesser evil. Uh, and I think this, this involves him um, in his last years in, in um, you know, some real serious mistakes, um, not only in terms of not criticizing um, labor actions that he would have criticized if they'd been done by anyone else, he actually, for example, doesn't criticize Labour's strike breaking. Um, he remains silent about that. But worse, he actually goes to work for, or he assists rather than goes to work for, a black propaganda outfit that Labour set up, the Information Research Department. Um, and this was, this, this was a terrible thing to do. Um, he, he does it because it's Labour. They were recruiting people um, on the left who were anti-Stalinist quite deliberately. Uh, and what Orwell does is provide them with a list of people not to employ. Now, this, this, when this list came to light, all Orwell's enemies leapt on it. Uh, and I would argue that while it is something that he should never have done, um, he should never have allowed his two anti-Stalinist books um, to be used by the Information Research Department because they weren't going to oppose Stalinism in order to further socialism. They were going to oppose Stalinism in order to protect the British Empire. Um, but this was not what he was about. He just didn't realize what they were about, which was a serious weakness. Um, but um, a lot of the people who criticize him, you know, are people coming from the CP tradition. And when you look at what communists at the time were covering up and apologizing for, I think we are entitled to criticize Orwell, but they bloody well ain't. You know, to have people who justified uh, the post war. Titoite purges in Eastern Europe and then turn around and criticize Orwell, uh, it really, it, 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 it's just not good enough. That these people are not entitled to criticize Orwell. We are. Not only that, of course, but although he's been accused of being a McCarthyite, the fact of the matter is that we know that Orwell actively defended the civil rights of Communist Party members, even while he was advising the IR. Um, D on who to get involved in anti-propaganda and who not to get involved. Um, he was part of the Freedom Defense Committee, which had been established 
uh, to defend civil rights in Britain, um, not just the civil rights of communists, but the civil rights of people um, that, that um, the communists would not defend. Um, anarchists, Trotskyists and other for the Freedom uh, Defence Committee defended people, generally speaking. One of the things Orwell was also involved in was to try and get um, the evidence of the Moscow trials reassessed now that um, Germany had fallen and it could actually be seen whether all the people who had been executed for being German agents, um, all the leaders of the 1917 revolution had been executed for being German agents, actually were German and he cooperated with the Revolutionist Party at the time um, in trying to push this idea forward. Uh, something that did actually cause the British government some embarrassment because they didn't want to upset the Russians. So, you know, you, you do see Orwell being pulled to the right, I would argue, by, um, by his um, lesser evil attitude towards Labourism, but he still remained absolutely committed uh, to democratic socialism, to the dispossession of the upper class, to the working class, and he, he included um, white collar workers, um, you know, what at the time he called middle class, but he was called white collar workers, becoming more and more involved in this movement, um, that this was something that he absolutely believed in. It uh, wouldn't do to um, have it just in Britain. That wasn't tenable. He thought the best way forward was to have a united socialist states of Europe. That's what he called for. And that was a first step towards the establishment of global socialism. This is not the program of the British Labour Party. It never has been. It puts him on our side of the barricade. Absolutely puts him on our side of the barricade. Uh, um, and I think you have to put up a fight to make sure that his politics um, are acknowledged that he's not successfully hijacked uh, and that um, you know, there's plenty in his writing that we can disagree with, but there's also plenty, I would argue, that we can take inspiration from. Thank you. Thank you very much there, John. That was fantastic. A very you know, comprehensive uh, analysis there of a whole range of Orwell's writing. Uh, some people have started putting their questions in, in the chat facility, so carry on uh, doing that. Um, one of the things that occurred to me was that um, part of my very introduction to socialism was uh, reading homage to Catalonia. And, and it was lucky for me that I managed to read that in Barcelona. Uh, I'd travelled down there as a, as a young uh, a kid and I arrived as there was just an election taking place in the Spanish state. And this was before the Barcelona uh, Olympics. So Barcelona, the you know, down by the port was still much as it had been in Orwell's time. And because there was an election, it was absolutely covered in red flags, uh, you know, for the various uh, leftist parties uh, in, in the election. And, you know, coming from very sleepy uh, Britain, uh, you got a little idea of what the excitement could have been like. Of course, to get that more of that excitement, you should read uh, uh, Orwell's uh, homage to Catalonia. And uh, actually in um, the Orwell in 1984 book, uh, Fu actually quotes a very important passage there uh, from that, talking about how uh, workers are on the streets, how the city is totally transformed, uh, how, how the middle classes are hiding and so on. Um, but just as a way of uh, an introductory question, um, I'd like to say that um, lots of these works, we talk about 1984, uh, we talk about Animal Farm, um, th these works have become very much uh, mainstream. As we said, they've been turned into plays and films and books, and the argument and the legacy uh, has um has been argued about and in some ways has been absorbed into mainstream uh, uh, culture, uh, quite often used as an argument against socialism. You know, we particularly think there of Animal Farm and and um, the whole question of uh, what, what it's really about. So I, I'd just like to throw that out there as an introduction, uh, an introductory question you might think about 
uh, about how how can that happen? How does that happen? There's such such a strong socialist. How can his works be then absorbed in, 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 into the mainstream culture? Let me just have a quick look at the comments and chat, and we'll see if there's any other more direct questions um, that that we can ask. There is a question there I did notice, uh, which you. Uh, uh, talked a, a bit about uh, John, which was about, um, it, it says, I can't find the actual quote, but I remember um, somebody saying, um, uh, from Tony Hodges, there you go. Tony says, uh, was it a Stalinist meal that he worked with the Secret Service and denounced other socialists? I mean, you said that he worked with um, the Labour Party there and gave a bit uh, but maybe you could come back a little bit more on that. Um, um, okay. Can, can I put those two questions to you now and then we'll have a little look at what it says in the comments and uh, come back for some more questions. Do, do you want to say anything first, Roger? Or um... Yes, can I just come back on something that Mark uh, Pinkerton wrote in the... Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. In, feel in, free. Uh, because it's about Burma, because I think it's quite important, is this kind of mistaken idea uh, about socialists and about human beings generally, is that the George Orwell who went to Burma as a policeman was not the George Orwell who went to Spain as a member of Pum and in, in the International Brigade. The whole thing is, is that Burma changed his consciousness. And uh, there's a great bit in the little Paul Foot pamphlet where he says... Um, he writes a book called Burmese Days, one of his first books. And the quote from that is, even those bloody fools at the club might be better company if we weren't all of us living a lie the whole time. The lie that we're here to uplift our poor black brothers instead of to rob them. And then Paul says he hated it. He hated the British in Burma. He hated his fellow policemen most of all. And as soon as he got home on leave, he resigned from the police force. For many years, he was plunged into a sort of guilt, which you are you see coming out all the time in his writing about what had happened in Burma. It made him into what he thought was a socialist. And that's the important thing about Burma, not whether or not he, what he would think of it today or whether or not he went there as a fully fledged socialist. What it was is that he saw British imperialism and he saw the actions of the oppressive nature of British imperialism there. And this is what changed him. It was mainly because of the amount of local Burmese, Burmese people. They hung. They hung kind of uh, hundreds of people. Uh, and uh, and uh, Orwell was absolutely appalled. So really, it was the first step on becoming George Orwell. Not that he went there fully fledged with the whole idea of what was, what was in his head. And that's the whole thing, I think, about Paul Flutt's speech, is that he shows out Orwell changes as he confronts the world and that's how we all change we all change as what we thought in our head was real meets something that contradicts that in the in, in outside of us so it's a it, that that's why he, it, that was it i just wanted to say that excellent thank you roger john have you got to come in there yeah i mean i, I think that point roger made is absolutely crucial all all well was a work in progress you know his ideas were continually changing um, this is the only way you can understand him. I, I, I'm inclined to say this is the only way you can understand anyone. Um, they're a work in progress, you know, and all of us certainly that. I mean, it, you know, what, how, what did he say? In, in Burma, he said um, the situation is one where the police hold the natives down while the businessman goes to his pockets. That's the nature of British imperialism. And he actually described it, of course, as the Fox Britannica, um, which I don't think you can get to any nearer being hostile to the British Empire than calling it the Pox Britannica. Um, but in, in, in terms of how he's been hijacked, um, I, I, I think the key to him being hijacked by um, people across the political spectrum, including people on the right, um, is really the amount of time that people on the left defended the Soviet Union. Um, I, I, I think this handed his writings over to them in many respects. Um, it wasn't him, it was the fact that there were still people on the left who were defending the Soviet Union. And let's be fair, many of them only turned against, you know, only recognized Stalin's crimes when the Russians actually admitted to them. 
Um, it took Khrushchev's revelations for many communists to actually say, oh, blimey, um, it, perhaps he was not such a nice bloke. Um, and I, I think from that point of view, this handed him over. Um, and of course, he wasn't in a position to fight this because he died. Um, you know, he died 19, um, at age 46. Uh, he popped his fogs. And when he died, he was protesting about the way his writings uh, were, were being hijacked. This, this, this is an absolute statement of fact. Now, we don't know how his ideas would have developed if he hadn't died. Um, there was a big debate about this where some of the American neocons who'd been Trotskyists back in the uh, late 30s and 40s ended up being neocons. Um, and some of them said Orwell would have done the same. Uh, and one bloke, a bloke called um, uh, Kazan or Kazin, I can't remember his name, he, he actually said, so what you're saying um, is that Orwell would have given up his identification with the working class and the oppressed and would have instead taken on board an identification with the rich and the right and the exploiters. And I think when you put it like that, this I myself can't see it as a jump that Orwell would have made. It's not just ideas, it's who you identify with. And Orwell had identified with the downtrodden, the oppressed, the working class, the exploited. He had a good understanding, even though, you know, he, he never worked in industry or anything like that. It, it, as we've all pointed out, he read widely. Um, he he uh, talked with people. Um, th this, this is something that I can't see myself. Although, you know, to some extent, what, what people... When people say Orwell would have done this, what they mean is he would have done what I've done. <laughs> <laughs> if you sold out, you think Orwell would have sold out. If you haven't sold out, you say, no, nah, no, nah, never. Um, but um, I, I, I'm inclined to think, you know, that the, get the leap to become a champion of the oppressed to a champion of the oppressor would have been too great for Orwell to make myself. Um, so I, I think that's one, uh, that, that's one side of it. Um, I can't remember the other question what was the other bit of the question about about uh, um working for this working for the secret oh state. yeah the, the information research department yeah absolutely um I, what, what orwell did was give them a list of names of people who he said um were not reliable in terms of um bringing on board an anti-communist propaganda effort now it's worse than that because when you look at the list and what he has to say about these people it is, as he admitted himself, slanderous. It's disgraceful. Some of the things he says uh, about the people on the list are absolutely disgraceful. Um, he should have been ashamed. Um, you know, th 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 this was pretty terrible stuff. But at the same time, like I said before, um, this was, as far as he was concerned, moving into a situation where there might well be a war uh, and he would rather have um, a Labour Britain win a war with Stalin Russia and Stalin Russia win it. This is what he thought was on the cards. Um, I think he was, you know, falling for the exaggeration um, that they that they launched the Cold War with, the exaggeration of, of, of Russia's aggression. I think Russia was a satiated power in the aftermath of the war. They, they couldn't digest what they'd already grabbed, let alone go after more. Um, so I, I think, you know, he fell for the Cold War lies that were being spun. Um, whether he would have continued to fall for them is another matter. When he'd realised what the Information Research Department was really about, um, and he would certainly have realised it once Labour lost power, I mean, it's worth bearing in mind, if I remember rightly, the Information Research Department played a role in framing um, the, um, the building workers during the building workers' strike. Um, the Shrewsbury people, the Information Research Department was actually involved in framing them. This is the way it developed. Um, there's no doubt in my mind Orwell would have broken with this organisation sooner or later, but he should never have been involved with it at all. Uh, and I think we have to be absolutely, uh, what's the word? No compromise. No, you know, we can't compromise our criticism in here, but we are entitled to criticise him. The people who were apologising for, for Stalin's terror aren't. Let me give you one example. This is this is from the um, the uh, Hope Lies in the Proles book. I've come across a woman called Edith Bone. Uh, Edith Bone was a lifelong communist. She'd been recruited by Victor Serge uh, back in the aftermath of the Russian Revolution. Lifelong communist, Hungarian woman. Um, and uh, she, she'd broken with the CP at the time of the Hitler-Stalin pact. 
She rejoins um, when the Nazis invade Germany. And after the war, she agrees to go to um, Hungary as the um, daily workers' correspondent. She arrives very quickly. She's arrested. She spends seven years in solitary confinement. Um, and the daily worker never even asked what happened to her. Um, they never even asked what happened to her. Um, this, this is the um, disgraceful way these people behave. Um, and they have the nerve to criticize George Orwell. She was released in 1956 by the revolutionary students. Um, that's when she was released. She spent seven years. She's a remarkable woman. I won't go into her life story. She's an absolutely remarkable woman. She made their bloody lives a misery in prison. Let me, let me put it that way. Um, she was a remarkably tough woman who, um, you know, once she sorted out the situation, she says it took her a number of years to actually work out, uh, that uh, it wasn't all a mistake. Um, that, uh, you know, it, she, she thought the Russian see, she put the secret peace with the good guys on the same side as her, protecting socialism. And then when she's been in prison for a couple of years, she realized, blimey, well, they're not. You know, they're not. A um, bit slow, but nevertheless, you know, they're not. As she says, it's Russian imperialism. You know, this is what's happening. It's a new imperialism. Um, but she's a remarkably tough woman. Orwell would have defended her from day one, communist or not. You know, the difference between Orwell and the communists was that the communists would defend communists being persecuted by a capitalist state. But they would justify the persecution of communists by a communist state, including murder, torture, um, executions, both official ones and unofficial ones. Orwell, um, despite the criticisms we can make of him with his IRB and IRD involvement, Orwell would defend communists when they're persecuted by capitalists and also when they're persecuted by communist regimes. Uh, and, you know, this, to my mind, um, really disqualifies people coming from a Stalinist, the Stalinist tradition from having the nerve to bloody criticise him at all. Yeah, there's a lot there, isn't there, John? And, and it's very relevant to today as well. You see various people get themselves in all kinds of uh, tangles about what the questions in Syria, you know, uh, Venezuela and all kinds of other questions. Uh, where, um, or even the attitude to Putin and so on, where um, the, the question of uh, who socialists should be supporting and on what basis uh, really uh, matters. And I think it's very important that when you talk about Orwell and we talk about Fu, uh, as Roger mentioned at the beginning, we're talking about characters that came from the ruling class, but very much identified with working class uh, um politics, but also identified with that, not merely, you know, the, the a rhetorical idea about revolution, but the revolution that socialism comes from below, comes from, uh, from the working class itself. And again, I think that is another question that's coming in uh, to play today. As we've seen, we've had Trump and so on. John has also written a, a very good book uh, about Trump. Uh, Man, man for all seasons, John. Eh? Uh, maybe you could talk about that as well. Um, but, but precisely, um, I mean, Christian uh, Hogsberg points out in the chat that Orwell doesn't just see Stalinism and fascism as totalitarian, but they also saw British imperialism and capitalism uh, generally uh, as totalitarian. And with the rise of Trump. Uh, and 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 so on. We're now, fortunately, Trump himself gone. But nevertheless, the, the the threat of that kind of authoritarianism still existing. People talking the news articles today about uh, Macron in France and the rise of authoritarianism there. The Orwell, it still seems to me, has a lot uh, to, to to teach us. And I realise that's a very general question there, but uh, if I can throw it back to you, I don't know, if, Roger. Do you want to come in there? Give John a wee break. <laughs> no, I, mean, I, th I think it's important to, uh, to, to keep on emphasising that, I mean, as Cliff used to say, is that when we came out of the, uh, when we came out of the Second World War, um, there was, or in 53, in fact, there was 50 years of reformism and Stalinism. So the kind of, the idea of, of Marxism or of socialism from below had been lost for 50 years um, in terms of both in the Stalinist uh, camp and, and, and in the reformist camp, because the reformists had 
well, we can't do anything but reform because yet otherwise you'll end up like them. And then they would say, well, you've got to stick with the hard iron kind of fist of the state, otherwise you'll end up like them. So the <laughs> thing was, that's why the great slogan, neither Washington nor Moscow, which was carried on the IS banner, and which it certainly uh, was the what, the banner that Paul Foot flew, um, would have also been one, I think, given what John's been saying and what we've been saying tonight about Orwell, he would have been under that banner as well. Um, I think he, he was an internationalist, and um, I think we we don't know that the, the, for a lot of newer comrades, uh, I mean, uh, 20th century, 21st century comrades, um, the idea that that kind of it, that, that there could be that influence of the Communist Party on the minds of people to force them to actually say and do things that are completely in contrary uh, to to the beliefs that they themselves have got. I mean, the, the, even the, the Stalinist historians, we used to say in the old days, um, A.L. Morton wrote a great book, Don't Read the Last Chapter. Um, <laughs> that, that book, Don't Read the Last Chapter, because the last chapter is always the Soviet Union as the way forward. So, you know, it's like, even they would in, even that dishonesty with inside the uh, the the, the uh, communist intelligentsia. I mean, Eric Hobsbawm is the classic. That dis that own their own dishonesty was something that uh, we had to live with in the uh, in the post war years. And no, I mean, I'm not that old, but certainly in the sixties and seventies when we were trying to build um, a, a, a socialist current, an independent socialist current, um, which gave enormous amount to um, him and Cliff, uh, that, that, that trying to build that independent current of socialism from below was a very important task to do. And I think it is good uh, that we include George Orwell in that, same as I'm always clanking on about William Morris, because I think he's in there as well. Uh, but certainly Orwell is, and the, the John's little book, The Guide, and also his wonderful book that I just picked up, uh, Hope lies with the poles, uh, George. I think again is that it's good that we're, we're revisiting that argument that Pete Sedgwick started in volume, what is it, number two of uh, of IS Journal. John, yeah, um, I mean, I, I did read uh, the last chapter of one of A. M. Morton's books where he says that. Um, Stalin had realised Morris's news from nowhere in the Soviet Union, um, which you know really makes you want to throw up, doesn't it, when you read that sort of stuff? Um, but to be fair to Hobsbawm, um, he did say that uh, the only reason Stalin, in the end, in the end, he said the only reason Stalin hadn't done something that looked like 1984 was because they never had the technology. Um, he did actually acknowledge. You know, at the end, Obsbaum acknowledged that the Stalin thing uh, was bloody horrible and had nothing. I don't know whether he said it had nothing to do with socialism, I don't know. But he acknowledged the full horror uh, uh, of the Stalin regime, although I'm not sure what theoretical conclusions he, he drew from it. Um, but um, it, 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 it's when we, the problem. Well, let me let me take up something else. One, one, the, the, the two big criticisms I would say with regards to Orwell. I mean, not a lot of other ones, but it's first of all, he, he never took on board feminism. Um, Orwell um, never took seriously, I would argue, women's oppression, and I think this is the big criticism of him. I think he was beginning to take it on board towards the end of his life, and this is despite um, having. You know, being friends with a number of women who were very strong supporters uh, of women's rights. I, I, I mean, um, Ethel Manning was one of them, you know, who actually dedicated one of her books to Orwell. Um, you couldn't get someone tougher uh, in the late 30s in terms of support for, uh, you know, w women's liberation than Ethel Manning. He, he never took this on board. I think he was beginning to change towards the end of his life. Um, but... Um, you know, this is this is the criticism that I see running right through his work that uh, he never really took on board uh, the oppression of women and what to do about it. Um, the other thing I've already mentioned is the lesser evilism, which I think um, he rise to some extent because he wasn't a member of an organisation and he got sucked by currents um, that quite often he would then draw back from 
but nevertheless, he got he got sucked uh, in directions that I think we we, we, we would regard as as wrong. Uh, and because he died before we know whether he would have, for example, supported the Korean War. I mean, he opposed um, British intervention in Greece in 1944, even though they were putting down a communist resistance movement. He was bitterly opposed to that. Um, and he said it's as bad as the Russians intervening in Poland. You know, you can't separate the two out. We've no right to interfere in Greece. Um, the Russians have got no bloody right to interfere in Poland. Um, he was absolutely hard on that. So whether he would have supported the Korean War or not, I don't know. I, 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 I hope he wouldn't have, um, but you know, he might have seen it as lesser evilism. Um, we really don't know. Um, so from that point of view, I, I would say you know that, that um, he's someone we can learn from, we can take inspiration from. That he has things to say that resonate. His, his use of language, you think, blimey. Um, that's that's a good way of putting it. You know, I mean, the Pox Britannica thing. He, he thought of that. That's beautiful way to sum up the British Empire. Um, he, he would come out with things that you think that's the way to do it. You know, um, when, when he, when he um, in a, a pamphlet he wrote, looking back on the Spanish War, not a pamphlet, an article, he says, you know, this the, this war, future wars, um, previous wars, they've all been about whether uh, the oppressed will be free. You know, uh, and he says, I hope to see social. Socialism, democratic socialism, the working class in power, uh, sometime, he says, in the next 100 years. Um, and that probably sounded very pessimistic at the time, uh, but that gives us till 2042. <laughs> you know. um, so yeah. it, 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 this is someone that we have to make sure we claim for our tradition, because there's a lot of people fighting for him. Uh, and I would argue the evidence is overwhelming um, that despite our criticisms, we would have him, of him, and he would have criticisms of us without any doubt. Nevertheless, if the barricades had gone up, Orwell would have been on the same side of the barricades as us, without any doubt at all. Brilliant, brilliant, John. Um, we're getting kind of close to where we need to f uh, finish now. Uh, I just uh, tell you a few things, and then maybe you come back just with a couple of sentences to to sum up. Um, our event uh, next week is going to be a, a poetry event, so look out for that. The publicity for that should be out soon. Uh, the week after that, we are very lucky to have a book launch uh, by Kieran Allen, um, who's written a new book on partition, The Failure of Partition and the Case for a United Ireland. Of course, uh, this uh, time when, you know, the the so-called the troubles in Northern Ireland seem to have come back uh, with a vengeance around the question of the border and the whether the borders in the IOC or a land border or, or whatever the question is, and with real hope perhaps of a united Ireland. So that's um, on the 30th and something people should really book your seats for now. And I'm glad not too many people down the pub tonight either. Um, okay, so... Um, uh, I think that's all I've got to say. I will just ask Roger and then John just for a few words to sum up, and that will be us. Roger. Yep, I thought it was an excellent, excellent meeting, and thanks, everybody. Um, I, I just want to say with Paul Foot, look at Paul Foot's books, read uh, Red Shelley, his great defence of uh, Percy Shelley, who was certainly in our tradition, and certainly would have been on our sides of the barricades. And so uh, we, Red Shelley, I don't know if it's still in print. If not, maybe Red Words should uh, bring it out. Um, and I think the other thing is his wonderful book, The Vote, how we won the vote and how it was distorted. A fantastic book of the history of, of the betrayal of reformism and why we need to be a revolutionary. So, yes, uh, please, please, comrades, uh, read Paul Foot. Thank you, Roger. John? Yeah, I mean, to me, the book of all worlds that first had a big impact on me was Homage to Catalonia, you know, which um, I'm sure I'm not alone in this. Uh, when I read it, it was a revelation um, to have an uh, English writer writing so powerfully about revolution um, and also, of course, put, put in the, the CP uh, in, in its place. This was very, very important to me. Um, back back in the 60s, when uh, I, I was grappling with these ideas myself. 
Um, I actually went to a CP meeting, a um, student meeting in Manchester, where I was, uh, you know, thrown out um, for, for some uh, untimely remarks that I made. Um, <laughs> Surely not. <laughs> this uh, homage to Catalonia was so important. Uh, and I, I, I think, you know, the, the, the point that Roger made, you know, when it comes down to it, the, the way forward is agitate, agitate, agitate. And that, that, that's the way we've got to go. Thank you, Roger. Thank you, John. And thank you, all you people out there listening, uh, as we'll be back next Friday over to Poetry Night and the week after that with Kieran Allen. In the meantime, Bookmarks, the actual shop, Bookmarks in real shop is open again 11 uh, a.m till 4 p.m on weekdays until 3 p.m on saturdays if you're in london or if you're uh, able to get down come down and visit us otherwise all these books that we've talked about uh and many many other books are available on our website or you can phone up or email us and um order books thank you all very much hope to see you again soon bye